Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present here and for the honor to open the first session. And I'm going to talk about a few of the projects we've been working on in the context of the BD2K UCLA Center of Excellence over the last uh, bit more than a year. And the grant, the Center of Excellence is really a lot about developing workflows, developing workflows which allow us to maximize the impact of data, which is in many cases already available, but often underused, and which we want to really exploit to the maximum. And the part, first part of this is to discover relevant data sets. And so the first um, major project and where we've invested a lot of effort in so far is the so-called Omics DI, the Omics Discovery Index. Um, so the aim is really to come to a situation uh, which is similar to what, uh, what PubMed has achieved for literature. Nowadays, finding a publication is fairly straightforward. You go to PubMed and you are pretty sure that you will find what you need through well-established um, and very intuitive um, search mechanisms. On the other hand, if you are not in PubMed, and this is as a literature provider, then also that's almost like you haven't published, which is really a big challenge sometimes. Um, but it really marks the unique position PubMed has achieved in being really the resource to identify relevant literature. In identifying a data set of interest or a set of data sets of interest for your research, the situation is very different. Uh, repositories for data are very often technology specific, domain specific. There are many disconnected search entry points and even the usually um, unfair un Failable Google does not work well because it does not separate out data sets. And so whatever search mechanism you, terms you use, you will get a big mixture of results. You will not get only relevant data sets. So what we really want to achieve is uh, to lay at least the foundations for a kind of PubMed for omics data sets. And the aim for the first release were to provide a data discovery index across genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics to integrate databases and repositories from both the US and Europe. After all, we are a European participant in a big US research program to integrate open and controlled access resources. We are, of course, we are uh, at the EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute. We are very much focused on open data, but same as the context here, a lot of the data which in principle um, is accessible must be protected because it's confidential uh, data with privacy issues. But also this data needs to be really well discoverable by its metadata. And then you can go through the process of getting access to the real data. And we want to provide the infrastructure to add new databases and repositories um, fairly easy to the existing infrastructure to search, navigate, and find high quality relevant data sets. And we have achieved a working, quite well working prototype within about less than a year by building on existing infrastructure, which um, already worked at the EBI to index data sets across all of the EBI. And the approach is that we link um, the target databases by their metadata. Each database provides for each data set a short XML message, which contains all the relevant metadata for this data set. These are then indexed by a Lucene-based indexing system. As mentioned, this is something which is already in production at the EBI, indexes more or less the entire EBI, so the European counterpart to NCBI with more than 1 billion entries. So we are fairly confident that the system will scale. And we have then extended this existing system with 
some specific components also on the middleware level to be able to collect access statistics. So whenever a data set is accessed through this index, then the, this, uh, this access will be counted to provide metrics, usage metrics for the data sets. And then we have, of course, built a web layer for search and visualization for these data sets. The status today is that we have a working alpha release, which is accessible at this URL. We are connecting six repositories from four organizations across three omics data types uh, across two continents. Currently, there are about 5,000 records. We are now in the stakeholder feedback phase, so we've um, made this URL accessible and we've already collected quite extensive feedback and we aim to provide uh, close this feedback phase more or less the end of this month and then go into implementing this feedback and have a full release latest in January 2016. And this is just a screenshot of the application. So you can search for data sets, uh, as I mentioned, by all the typical metadata items, um, organ, tissue, um, experimental approaches. You get an overview of what is available in the repository uh, on this um, association of repositories and you then can zoom in on the relevant data sets which your search has identified. So the key point is really we have built up a federated repository. We are only centralizing the metadata. We are not trying to copy lots of data around and we provide easy access, easy findability of the data by the metadata. That metadata is provided by the individual repositories. So it's their responsibility, which means they have an interest in providing good metadata, again, following the PubMed model, it's the publisher's job to provide the metadata rather um, so that they feel the better metadata they provide, the more their papers will be found. And yeah, as I mentioned, the system is working now and is built on a fairly scalable infrastructure. So going from to the next step, from data discovery to data access. We are um, developing an infrastructure to access omics data, again, across multiple distributed repositories um, through web services, so that once you have identified a data set, ideally, you can, um, from a centralized, uh, using centralized um, protocols, web service protocols, you can access the different repositories, the actual data in these repositories with a whole variety of clients, whether you want to use, say, R to do a statistical analysis, whether you want to do a more targeted data type specific analysis like focused on all identifications of a certain protein across many tissues, or if you want to do more ambitious data aggregation. You can follow you can use the same protocol proxy to access all of these repositories and retrieve the data in a distributed manner. So the status here is much earlier. We have discussed, uh, we have had community discussions about this project, mainly at the PSI, the Proteome Extends Initiative meeting um, last, uh, uh, last April. And we have first prototypes, first specifications for this project, but there is still a long way to go to make this really into a working system, which really allowed, allows disseminated, distributed access to a whole set of repositories. But the good part is we are now implementing this for uh, molecular expression resources. We have already a working system which follows the same principles for molecular interaction data, which has been in production for several years. So we know that we can be fairly confident to that it will eventually work. Again, there's a whole set of entry points if you want to join the discussion and specification. But again, this is still very early. 
Moving on to the next step in a typical workflow, once you have data, of course, you want to analyze it. And there are many ways of analyzing data. And part of the effort between the Center of Excellence and the Coordination Center is the Tool Discovery Index, which we will hear more about later, which will help you to choose different methods to process your data, to analyze your data. I'm going to zoom in on one approach, namely through the Reactome Pathway Database. Reactome is, is also an NIH, largely NIH-funded project, but also with European funding, where the aim is to go from textual representation of pathway descriptions to electronically accessible pathway reviews and pathway maps like this, which are not pictures, but where every element is active and clickable and you can interact with it. Reactome focuses on annotation of human pathways and now covers about 8,000, more than 8,000 protein coding genes based on 18,000 literature references. And it also covers 1,400 small molecules. We normally, we originally annotated normal pathways and have moved on to annotating also disease variants of pathways more recently, mainly in cancer, because this is an obvious starting point. And what we have done in this project so far is we have strengthened, strengthened the reactome pathway analysis tool, where you can send molecular expression data sets. So again, fitting the workflow against the Reactome tool. And you can then see on a first high level an overview of how your expression data set maps to the entire hierarchical Reactome pathway structure. In this overview here, each of these bursts is one major node, one top level pathway like metabolism, cell cycle, which then goes down to detailed sub pathways. And you can, through this color coding, see where something interesting happens in your specific data set. And then you can zoom in to the specific pathway maps, and you can, again, see um, color-coded mapping of your input data onto these pathway maps. So these, this was a quick overview of the three major projects we have been working on so far in the context of the UCLA Center of Excellence. And you will hear more about some of these in the subsequent talks, the posters, and the webinar tomorrow. And I would like to acknowledge those who have really done the work. For the uh, first project, Omics DI, these are Yasser Perez Riverol and Ming Zabai. For, uh, yes, it has also done a lot of the work on the um, interface specification proxy. And for the Reactome project, Antonio Fabregat and Costa Sidiropoulos are both here in the room. And I'm sure we'll be happy to answer any detailed questions at the poster session. Of course, all of this would not be possible without extensive funding, mainly from NIH, but also from the Wellcome Trust. UK BBSRC and EBI core funding, collaboration and contribution from other EBI collaborators, and of course, the PIs in the projects which are related, and specifically Pepe, who gave me the chance to be here today. Thank you. Can you say something about your stakeholders for Omics DI, who they are, and where you're finding them from, the evaluation? So, specifically um, for the evaluation phase now, which we are in, we have talked to a number of um, people who have voiced an interest beforehand. We are disseminating um, the pro that the project exists through channels like the PSI initiative, through the, um, through the BD2K itself. And a big part of what I hope still will happen is the coordination with BioCaddy, because ultimately what we are doing is very closely related to what BioCaddy aims to do in a much larger context. I've already 
um, given a seminar about um, the first part of this, the rules of this, the proteome exchange approach um, in a BioCaddy webinar quite a while ago. And these are the main um, evaluation channels now. And then, of course, once we are a bit more confident with what we have, we will go to the wider public and do systematic user evaluation. EBI has an, a specific team for um, user experience testing, where we tend to then go out targeted to usage institutes and really sit with a few representatives of the usage community for an extended time with really somebody taking notes and seeing how they interact. But of course, also this is one of the, this is actually the first meeting where we are talking about um, these projects, um, at least for Omics DI, to a broader, uh, broader group of people rather than just a few people or by email. So any feedback is highly welcome. So what is the level of effort in terms of people um, providing um, metadata to the discovery index? So, so far, the, um, we built this on the existing Proteome Exchange collaboration. That was the starting point. And so the current metadata structure is very, sim very similar to the Proteome Exchange one. And in turn, the Metabolome Exchange um, Consortium, which again is a transatlantic consortium, was modeled on Proteome Exchange. And so for these two, the metadata just worked because this was the starting point. We had to work much more um, with the European Genotype Phenotype Archive, which is what I mentioned, the closed archive where only the metadata is accessible. And you have to get access or to the real data through after authorization from the ethics board. And there they really had to do serious work and in some cases re-annotate their data to at least provide most of the metadata which we are requesting in the um, omics di we are actually separating the metadata levels into mandatory desirable and optional and we are now at the level where they can provide at least the mandatory fully and part of the work and something which only got released actually yesterday is that we now have a metadata validator because we learned well it's quite a lot of work to go back and forth um, to sort out the file the metadata we now have a validator available, which for a given data set just reports for every data set, um, multiple levels, so error, this is missing, this is essential data, warning, and so on. So that is now available so that the integration of the next repository is at least on the technical level much easier. You still have to do the work, but at least it's easy to do the validation. Thank you. Thanks for um, allowing me to present our work. Um, my gene.info and my variant.info, both projects are developed under the BD2K umbrella. And what I, uh, my gene.info and my variant.info is, is basically is a gene and the genetic variant annotation as a service. And in a nutshell, I think um, both projects like deal with about the gene <coughs> and variant annotations. And we do the aggregation of the variants from multiple webs, uh, multiple resources, so that our user don't have to do this. And then we uh, then we de deliver it to the user using a high performance and a real time web service. That's essentially what the mygene.info and the myvariant.info is. And as the target target user for this two project is uh, the uh, bioinformatics developer who want to develop either the analysis pipeline or the web application for other users to use so that they don't really have to deal with their own uh, local database and for the aggregating all this gene and the genetic uh, variant annotations. Okay, so um, before I start, I want to uh, want to show this slide because uh, my variant.info project actually specifically is a, started from uh, the first so-called network of biosense hackathon in last year. Actually, uh, my variant info can be a good example for uh, for the for the hack zone. I think Andrew will talk about this more uh, in tomorrow's uh, session. So we started this project in this hack zone, and we <coughs> formed a collaboration. And we uh, also at the end we uh, we uh, 
submit a proposal and the reason that we got funding. This is a, actually a really good uh, outcome come out of the, this hackathon. Okay, so uh, when we talk about the annotations, I think for gene annotation, I don't even need to need to have a slide to show uh, why this is important. Everybody going to need the gene annotations. And there's a lot of resources you can get the uh, gene annotation, but you still need to do a lot of like maybe the data parsing and, and download the file, keep maintaining the, all the update. So, but for the very annotation, recently it becomes a really much much more like trending because of the booming of the NGS technology, right? Because we people want to interpret the variants we observed from the patient and so that we hopefully we can uh, we can know the impact for the for the for the clinical diagnosis or even like for the treatment of the disease. So there's, so now we have a lot of uh, variant annotation resources here. All of this basically contributing some attribute to uh, each specific variant that like I showed in here. Um, let me see how does that actually work. You show like here, basically everyone, each of this resource probably contributed some of the annotation for the specific variants, right, like this. And, but the, the problem is right now the variant annotation is a, there's a lot of fragmentation here. We, right now in the society, we don't really have, a, have like a consistent ID to represent each variant. So there's a lot of mess, a lot of, a lot of problem um, when people deal with all these variant annotations. And my variant learning info project actually targeted to is this process and speak of the variant uh, speak of the like annotations i think all the annotations we have right now is you can see is essentially targeted essentially like centered around all this so-called like bi entities we have the gene then we have the gene annotations like this the variant annotation there's a pathway there's a metabolite and a disease so we know all, all of this in reality all of those are connected together but when we represent the annotation annotation, we need to, we basically, the naturally, we think we're going to focus on one specific gene or one specific variant, and we start to adding the, all the annotation related to this gene, related to variant annotation to this bio, uh, biological entity. That's how we uh, normally present this data. And, and from these slides, I basically want to show a very simple uh, chart, show the how the actually right now, how right now we deal with, uh, we do the, all the kind of like the biological research, right? Essentially all the annotation, we think is essentially is, uh, is a representation of all structural and pre, pre, uh, previous knowledge. And about the literature essentially is uh, unstructured uh, knowledge. So our process basically is uh, we based on the known knowledge of this and develop the new experiment, new experiment and then we have the result and publish in the literature, and hopefully this will come to the annotation really fast. And hopefully this this uh, feedback group will come like very efficiently, so that we can push forward as a research uh, forward. Um, so the, I think the one I want to mention this process from the literature to annotation, and that actually uh, the Mark Tucker project, Andrew and uh, and Ben led, it will basically handle this process, help this process, and about the, my gene.info and my variant.info project, and also another project related to this is called BioGPS, I'm not going to talk about it here, it's going to be help the, this process basically, help the annotation fast deliver to the researchers who are actually using this no, no, uh, previous knowledge to, uh, to, for their research. Okay, so um, my gene.info and my variant.info essentially is a, is a centralized solution. Centralized solution, there's a couple of like uh, advantages, and also there's some limitation. But uh, to make like a bit, uh, make a good centralized and a web service provider, I think there's a couple of uh, uh, important feature we need to uh, keep in mind. First, it must be very easy to use; otherwise, people just don't use it, right? And it can be much must be very useful. And also, it must be uh, high performance, and uh, because a lot of people are going to hit your uh, hit your tool at once, and you need to be very high performance when demands um, come up, and you need to uh, very easy to scale your tool and so that to meet the demands. And your data, you must be very uh, up to date, 
And another thing is uh, important thing is like you need to be like uh, very extensible for your tool. Otherwise, uh, your centralized uh, uh, resources going to be just to be another fragmented resources. It's not going to be uh, um, like used by the user in the long run. Okay, and we specifically developed this two project and with those three uh, four points in mind. This is how we do it, and. I'm actually going to just be using the uh, variant annotation as an example, and the gene annotation essentially is the same thing, um, same same uh, in, same infrastructure and the same idea. Um, okay, so variant annotation here is right now instead of representing a variant annotation in a, like a uh, table, rec like rectangular table, we represent a variant annotation in a so-called like a JSON format. JSON is a rich data structure you can represent the very uh, different kind of the data data object like a key value pair and then object like this with some nested uh, nested structure or maybe like there's an array you can you can represent it's a very suitable to represent a very heterogeneous data and also friendly for both the human and a computer and we don't need to do any parsing there's a ready parser you can just reading uh, very nicely you don't have any hassle to pass the like the uh, tab delimiter file when people maybe like add one column that's going to be the like a causing a lot of headache okay so and then now next treatment is basically we want to add as like id in front of the for each project and also put the like a so-called like a namespace for this information where this come from this is the information come from cosmic now we do the same thing for other resources you can see each each resources, you can have their own data structure under here, right? It's independent of each other, but it's, all of these resources, all this annotations about is the same variant. And this ID we use called like HGBS name. Now it's become, it's still, it's still evolving, but it's become more and more popular to represent as a variant. variant. And, and same thing, like here is we build a very simple and but effective uh, uh, aggregation mechanism, basically is aggregating all this information from different resources first to convert to a single small piece of the JSON document, and we then aggregate it together, become a, a one large merged uh, um, like a object about this particular uh, variant. And it, this is probably just like a real example of the one genetic variant, probably very long. So in order to access this, we build a very efficient uh, query engine. So that people not can uh, access those variant object by the ID, you can also access by all the, every attribute within your object. For example, you want to query for like a, give me all the variants uh, like a like a polyphen predicted is a possible damage or like a allele frequency less than 0 0.001, something some criteria like this. You can do that. So we build a very uh, efficient query engine specifically for this purpose. We actually put a lot of effort to try to engineer the, or this uh, query engine, make it like a really scalable, really high performance, and it's uh, hosted on the cloud, and we uh, we currently very happy about the performance it can provide, and also the scalability it can, uh, we can we can grow in the future. And I'm gonna skip all this like technical details and jump to this. So, like this is what, for the end user, the myvarian.info will provide essentially just a two endpoint. Very simple. You can do all the magic using just this two uh, two end endpoints. One is based on the variant ID. You can get it back all the matching one. And also, if you don't know the variant ID, you can use in all kinds of a query parameter uh, to get back the matched uh, variants. So um, similar for the myjin.info, we have the also two uh, two uh, endpoints. For gene, it's a little bit easier because the gene ID, like either NCBI gene ID or ensemble gene ID, going to be natural, like identify you can use, right? And, okay, so so this one basically I want to show you the my gene.info data coverage. Basically, uh, the my gene.info right now support all species with at least one genes, and we have more than 50 annotation fields, and we are still in a, uh, expanding this coverage, and we keep a very tight weekly update. To the actual data, um, and we have the we released the mygene.info a little bit earlier, so that's why I uh, want to show you the actual performance or the usage statistic using mygene.info as an example. And um, right now we uh, have this mygene.info serve about 100k requests per day, and we can handle a really good uh, concurrency request uh, for our web services. 
and uh, this is like a real time a real like a uh, usage right now and this is basically the for our system we have done some uh, stress test right now we can show that we can handle with the current system we can handle the 10k request per minute for over 5000 concurrent users that's really um i think we still have a lot of capacity for the, our current setup for the for even like a more user to use it and this usage statistic shows that basically we monthly we get about two and three million requests per month for my gene.info right now. Um, and it's always a fun to show this slide. This is basically I, I want to show like this is the peak usage we recorded so far. And we recorded like this like five hit, five million hits per day. Actually, you can see very sharp like a peak here, and it actually happened on the last Christmas. Mm -hmm. Apparently, some people are really working working uh, really hard. So that's really uh, fun to see. Um, now, um, back to the myvariant.info stats. We just released the myvariant.info about two months ago. Right now, we have about 60K requests per month right now, which is a pretty good start. And I have, for now, we have about over 290, 290 million variants we uh, aggregated. And we include all the, I think, the 12 resources from all this uh, from the community, especially, I want to highlight the DBNSP. This essentially is uh, is already an uh, aggregation of all the prediction score for the genetic variant. And also, there's a clean bar. You probably know that. And exact is a population genetic summary you can get from the from the database. I also want to highlight the Weldly. This is actually is a um, it's a population study conducted by uh, by Scripps Translational Institute, and we have this data. This is this data is only released from the my myvariant.info. It's a very uh, unique data for the um, for the myvariant. Other stuff, other annotation is aggregated from other uh, public resources. Okay, so we also did a very simple use case for the. Uh, for uh, to demonstrate uh, the usage of the, all this high performance uh, web service because the target use case is for the user if they want to do some analysis and they don't really want to they don't really need to deal with all the database downloading parsing all this tedious work I remember this uh, blog post or Twitter mentioned all the bioinformatics work basically 90% of your work is doing dealing with the, like flat file and deal with the file parsing, and you probably only have 5% or 10% of time doing the real research. So actually, we want to uh, really simplify this process so that people don't have to deal with all this data, and the data is always uh, up to date. So in this use case, we take the data, uh, NGS data, it's actually the whole exon sequencing data from, uh, from a group and uh, uh, want to identify the causal uh, gene for the uh, Miller syndrome. Um, from all the, there's, I remember there's a four patients and we have do some like an input variance about, uh, here I summarize it by genes. The input is going to be like about 2,000 genes after some filtering by the quality uh, score based on the data itself. And then you can do like one filter is using the functional, what's the functional impact? Basically you can get it from the field from my variant the info called CAD and there's a consequent field. That will show you uh, what are those what are those variants located in the um, in the functional region? Like the coding region is non-synonymous, and maybe the splice side, all this. That actually will dramatically filter down the gene down to 20, 28. And then the next one, you can filter by the filter for the real variants. And you can use in the data from exact. If there's a low frequency, you can say like maybe I will uh, filter for those genes containing the variants with uh, with a very low area frequency in exact data. So that way you can filter down to 14 now. And then now at the end, uh, last step we can do, okay, among these 14 candidate genes, what are those genes actually involved in at least uh, one, uh, at least in the metabolic process? Because we know the, uh, from the uh, phenotype of the Miller syndrome, we know this is involved like uh, some disruption of the uh, patient's uh, metabolic system. So we then can using them uh, data from my gene, called like a Go, using like a Go annotation from my gene um, for those uh, metabolic Go category. Then you can get down to uh, like a half of the list, and now you have the seven genes as uh, as your uh, candidate list. And now it's very good and is very handleable by the 
bio, uh, biologist, they can do the further annotation, uh, further study, and uh, try to identify the actual causal one. Actually, the uh, um, real causal gene in the, this paper is uh, show up in the first in this list. They call it DHODH. This is um, this is basically just to show you uh, the typical workflow conducted by the bioinformatics. They can you can using uh, rely on the, like my info and my my gene.info to do your research and without worry about the endline database or this all these things. Okay. And and I want to show the what's on our to do list for this two project. One is uh, we want to develop like so called like a data plugin because we want to be like extensible and we want to do uh, and involve other people to contribute the data, not just our people from our development team. Another, we want to develop something using the uh, JSON LD to develop a link the data so that we can link together between the like a gene variant and maybe pathway to disease to a metabolic and all this thing. And another thing, another component that we want to develop, make this API is even called like a smart API. It's essentially is that we can do the semantic annotated API so that it can help the discovery of this API make people to uh, easy to change the API into uh, like a workflow environment. That's pretty much uh, what we are uh, planning to do. And uh, and this is the last slide I actually want to bring uh, like for discussion is that uh, is traditional I think is a uh, like an NCBI and example has been very successful as a, like a data repository. Right? And uh, now there's a like, new concept under the BD2K uh, umbrella is called like an uh, NIH comments. In my ideal world, I think that at least a part of the NIH comments can do is make the NIH comments as an API or even more broadly as a general bioinformatics application repository so that, so that people can, outside of the, this uh, NIH, can, like in the research community, people can contribute the, not just the data and also the application and it better serve to the other, um, other uh, the whole research community. I would like to uh, hear some more about this from the audience. If you have anything, we can, we can discuss. Okay, this is my last slide. I want to acknowledge uh, people from uh, Andrew's group and all the development team. And Sean is our uh, key uh, collaborator and all the collaborator for this uh, project. This is two project is uh, currently funded uh, by both uh, BD2K uh, Center of Excellence and um, also the U01 um, BD2K uh, grant for the targeted software development. Thank you. two follow-up questions for you and it's a very nice talk. Thank you so much. The first one, uh, thank you. The first one is um, have you analyzed your user community in terms of are they academic researchers, are they medical researchers, are they clinicians? I'd be interested to see that sort of breakdown of who's, who's looking at the tools right now. And the second is you briefly described the infrastructure that you're using. Is it uh, UCLA cluster cloud or is it um, a different sort of infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah, so first question is of our user. That user, user stand mostly come from the my gene done info right now because it's released a little bit uh, earlier. And that I think um, most, as far as I can tell, is mostly the academia. And you can see the, all the, um, we know some uh, collaborator, like uh, some University of uh, Washington, they develop some web application, Civic, and also the people from, uh, um, Monarch Initiative, they have the web application, so they rely on the bygene.info providing the uh, annotation. We know that uh, also our bygps is built on top of the bygene.info, so you know all this traffic constantly come from those uh, applications. Also, you can see sometimes the peak usage is that's most likely from the people who develop annotation oh, analysis pipeline, and I can see mostly look from the academia, like from a lot of from. Uh, UK Cambridge and from Broad and from you know from Washington, um, Baylor. All, we can see all this all around the world and a lot of us actually from China too. Yeah. And the second question is about the infrastructure. This inf well, we build all this infrastructure on top of the Amazon cloud right now. And yeah, and it, we like it because it also allow us to seamlessly to scale up, and which also fits our our goal. Uh, but to make it like a more robust, high-performance, scalable services. Yeah.
Today I wanted to talk um, actually a little bit uh, more about my research interest in clinical decision support and how we could potentially leverage a lot of the uh, advances that are being developed out here uh, with this uh, center of excellence um, in some of the research that I've been trying to do. Um, and so, as Alex said, my interest is in um, looking at medical data visualization and how do we present the dense medical record, as Dr. Dubinet alluded to, in terms of the growing amount of clinical data that's being collected um, in an intelligent way or in a way that a physician can effectively use um, at the point of care. And so I don't think I need to explain too much uh, to this audience the importance of biomedical literature and the fact that it's growing at a very fast pace. And so if we even take a look at one particular um, area, such as non-small cell lung cancer, we can see that there is a growth in papers. And so if we looked at 2013, there were about 3,400 papers and 200 odd clinical trials that have been reported. How does a clinician effectively take this information and stay on top of it? Because it's going to continue to grow, especially as we get more and more advances in the genomics. And so really the challenge is how do we effectively summarize and leverage this knowledge um, for the practice of evidence-based medicine. And so if we look at papers today, uh, you can see it's very unstructured. Um, clinical trial literature oftentimes have a variety of different information from background information, such as probabilities, uh, knowledge that we may already have from either uh, existing uh, experiments or a summary from uh, sort of a medical uh, textbook and so forth. Um, but also it has a specific information about the experiment that the investigators perform, such as the eligibility criteria of the patients, um, for the different results, for example, statistical analyses that were performed, um, perhaps uh, what was actually um, found to have a significant response rate versus not, um, and also the raw data, such as what we can see uh, on this end with all the actual reported data that was collected. For clinicians, how they ultimately take this information is it's hard for them to stay on top of individual papers, so they often rely on um, at, uh, or abstracted information, such as um, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and so for example, here's one example of a system called UpToDate, which uh, experts have gone through the literature already and created some guidelines and recommendations uh, for physicians to follow, as well as um, clinical guidelines that, uh, for example, like the one uh, published by the NCCN, um, where it basically guides through a series of different decision um, points here uh, what patients should undergo, and for example, you can see how complicated it can get um, as they get um, uh, diagnosed with different types of stages, for example, what are the follow-up uh, pretreatment and treatment type options. And so you can see from just this quick overview that there's a lot of different um, limitations to our current uses of, of biomedical literature. First is that there's various levels of study details that are completely lost. Um, we tend to look at the generalizations and the conclusions, but we don't know exactly or we don't keep track of the exact um, study population and details that may actually be very important in influencing who should get a drug and at what point. Um, and we only believe the dramatic interpretations, and this is very much true right now as, you, as we see in U.S. politics, right, where the louder you are and the more dramatic you are, um, that's the people that we hear. And so in this case, in the literature too, I mean, the same findings, the more dramatic findings are the ones that we hear oftentimes in the news, um, but there's a lot of other studies that are lesser known um, that are still very important. There's also a lag that exists between the latest findings and the published reviews. Um, and so again, these reviews oftentimes take place every few years. And so we don't keep in touch with a lot of the current uh, the latest breaking uh, type findings. Um, and then we don't have a means to systematic examine the entire knowledge space because a lot of this is fragmented. We have a great resource such as PubMed, but then the information and the linkages in that information is not explicit. And so how do we address that integration? And so just to summarize, the need for computable literature includes the fact that these are unstructured um, information from the paper that uh, is somewhat inconsistent and they're spread across a lot of different sections. We wanna be able to integrate that. Um, the quality of the information is variable. And so how do we systematically assess what is a good study versus not, um, as well as to uh, look at the lack of integration and looking at how do we actually look at evidence that may be conflicting, evidence that may strengthen a certain um, type of uh, a finding or also what is not known about um, a specific area. And so to put this in the context of the big picture, um, at the Medical Imaging Informatics Group, uh, this is the lab that actually Alex uh, Bowie PIs, 
Um, we're interested in looking at observational data that's collected in clinical practice and using it as a way to answer scientific um, hypotheses. And so really it goes through the process of the fact that medical records are very messy and unstructured data sources. And so uh, for a lot of things such as imaging, because we're in radiology, we have a lot of interest in images, we need to be able to acquire this information um, to be able to structure it, normalize it, standardize it, um, be able to then create a population-based models based on a large population that we have from the medical record. Same thing with our text information. So there's a lot of natural language processing that is going on to extract information from the medical record to look at what are the reported findings and symptoms, um, laboratory values and so forth. Um, and then to integrate this as part of a, um, a integrated database. Now, where the literature comes in is really the idea of how do we take the information that we know, the knowledge that we know from experiments and help filter out or relate some of the data features and data elements that we may be getting from the medical record. And then from there, constructing these types of what's called data multi-scale data disease models, which essentially means building linkages between the different data sources from the different um, biological scales, uh, as well as building the applications that will let us then um, be able to use this information to present medical record or to create decision support tools and so forth. And so I'm just going to feature a few different projects that I've been lucky to be involved in um, and talk about some of the efforts that we've been doing towards these aims. So the first one is research maps. And this is actually a brainchild of a professor named Asino Silva, and he's actually a professor here in neurobiology. And he actually um, came up with the idea of being able to simply represent causal assertions in the biological literature that he was looking at. And so um, his particular interest was um, in uh, the neuro neurobiology and neurofibromatosis. Um, and so, you know, what he wanted to do was create a personal map of this information where he was using a graph with nodes to represent different biological entities, edges to represent causal connections and different types of experiments. Um, and he used this to integrate the different um, papers that he was reading, he and his lab were reading, and being able to then quantify it with some weighting to be able to look at, well, what is the effect of multiple papers um, talking about the same um, relationship? And so he built this tool called Research Maps, and it's a web-based tool um, that organizes this information. And so let me give you just a quick overview of what it looks like. And so this is just the different um, types of uh, graphical uh, metaphors that we use in research maps. Here, for example, are the biological entities. And we can actually have different types of connections. So here uh, we have what's called a positive manipulation connection, which means that we, um, from the, the from the sort of the target to the agent, we have different um, directed arrows. Um, and then the positive manipulation just means that we're increasing the um, the agent and then seeing what effect it has on the target. Um, we have also inhibitory type of negative manipulations, such as the one here. Um, we have what's called hypo hypo Pathetical um, sort of uh, manipulations, which essentially are, you know, we, um, and they're represented as this gray arrow. And it just means that we haven't, or we don't know of any experiments that, um, that have tested this, but we actually hypothesize that some relationship does exist. Um, and also um, no manipulation where we actually measured these two different um, entities, but then we didn't see an observed effect. And so associated with each of these um, relationships, then we actually have weightings. And this is related to the different papers that we have met, read that actually talk about this specific relationship. And so the stronger the weighting, the more papers that kind of agree upon that relationship, as well as different icons to represent um, either a negative um, or a um, inhibitory effect versus a excitatory effect or no effect. And so those are the different types of simplistic uh, icons that we're trying to use to represent this literature. And so the process of doing this right now is purely manual, and obviously that poses some challenges. And so what we've done is we've actually taken um, a lot of these different papers, um, and so these are just examples of different sentences that may be from the literature, and we're translating that into specific propositions here. So for example, protein alpha um, is related to um, calcium synaptic uh, plasticity and so forth, um, as well as beta. And then we're actually um, mapping it out into specifically negative, uh, no, or positive type of relationships. And so this is how, as we tabulate it out, this is how the weights are actually calculated out. Then it can actually be then simplified into a specific graph. So this is the graph structure that we see here. 
And then followed by the hypothesis is once we have a computable representation, we can start running algorithms that will let us look at, well, what are specific type relationships here? And so, for example, beta may have some inhibitory effect on alpha, which then has an excited effect on the spatial learning. And so these are just screenshots of um, that tool that we have uh, built out. So this is a web-based system. It's actually available at researchmaps.org. Um, it's live right now. Um, and so it, we try to keep it simple in terms of the types of questions we ask the users to input. Um, same thing here. Now that we want to search the maps, we can actually run some global searches across different maps of this information. Um, and you can see here that there are some filters and certain things that you can interact with on the map to help you identify what papers were used to create this map and what were their uh, relationships. You can imagine that, you know, given that this, uh, this is a highly manual task right now, one big challenge is how do you scale this? And so one of the exciting things that I learned about um, this center of excellence is that there is this effort to do automated summarization. And this is led by Professor Carlos Zaniolo from Computer Science. And he's really interested in looking at, well, how do we use a text mining approach to do this? And he's been demonstrating in his previous work using uh, Wikipedia and DBpedia as knowledge sources to be able to generate these info boxes, which are these very brief summaries of articles that are in free text. And so what he does is he uses a text mining system called Sumscape, and he actually goes in and tries to simplify sentences into um, basically a subject, attribute, and value, and so this type of triples. And so once he does that, he's able to then build these knowledge bases uh, using web technology, uh, semantic web technologies, and then he uses this language called Sparkle that actually lets him then do a uh, retrieval. And so there's a lot of really interesting work that you know I, I've, I've been learning about in recent uh, weeks as well um, that we're looking to partner with him um, to be able to scale out um, a research maps type system. So translation of this knowledge then is to really then bring this back to the medical record. And this is an area that um, I've been personally interested in working in, um, in collaboration with uh, Alex Bowie, as well as um, uh, some of the clinicians within our group. And so here we're looking at basically taking the medical record and being able to tailor the presentation of the medical record um, to be able to facilitate navigation and interpretation based on linkages from biomedical literature. And so the important thing here is the idea of context, which is how do we use information from literature and other sources to provide us with a better understanding of the specific data elements that are collected in the medical record. And so very early on, um, back in 2000, uh, Jim Cimino, uh, who uh, um, basically looked at a lot of the use of ontologies, first described this idea of being able to use ontologies and the relationships of ontologies to link different data elements in the medical record or data that's collected together. And so what we wanted to do was be able to then apply the same concept to apply or integrate uh, literature information. And so the idea is simply, we can have different findings from the medical record. And so you can assume that this is a structured medical record with the findings that have been standardized and being able to map for different patients this information to a specific knowledge graph or some type of knowledge, uh, basically a graph of the literature and other knowledge that may specifically express, uh, for example, given edema, um, what are some of the associated um, symptoms of edema, um, cause of it, as well as specific types of drugs that may be associated with it. And so these, again, you can think of as the research maps uh, type of graphs that we expand into the clinical domain. Um, for that, then, we want to be able to create this medical visualization where we essentially look at if we give the entire medical record with a lot of different data points, a lot of different data types, it's pretty overwhelming to look all at once. And right now, the medical records such as EPIC and so forth, they present information very transactionally. And what we want to do is look at more of a problem-centric view where we say for a specific problem, this is the timeline of information that we have. These are the specific relevant data points that are brought um, to bear based on the literature and based on this knowledge graph, we can look at the relationships and weightings of it to be able to then say, for a given type of uh, interest or question that a clinician have, what are the specific data elements that may be of most interest to uh, be able to answer that question? And so this is the type of visualization that we're working towards building. And so to summarize, um, biomedical literature is a rich source of defining information um, for a disease. But it's very often unclear how caregivers should apply this information. And so some of the opportunities of BG2K has been really, as I've been hearing about data annotations, really how do we formally represent and standardize literature annotations? A lot of groups are doing it, but how do we actually 
coalesce around specific annotations for the literature, as well as how to link evidence being reported across biological scales and how do we integrate conflicting and supporting information across multiple studies. And so again, this is a representative work, uh, for example, uh, Wei Wang has been involved very much, um, as well as um, the CTSI uh, that uh, Dr. Dubinet leads um, has been essential. And actually, we recently just got funding for doing research maps in a clinical domain, so expanding it out from sort of the biological domain that Dr. Silva has originally been working in. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the different graduate students and uh, faculty and mentors, and thank you.